please can I ask that you remain standing whilst my chaplain, Deacon Jim Cardy, offers prayers for this meeting. We pray and give thanks for the Mayor and for her commitment over the last year. We pray for sick council members or family who are ill at the moment. We pray for former councillor and mayor, Audrey Bennett, whose funeral was last week. May she rest in peace. And we pray for family and friends who feel her loss most. We pray for the mayor's charity, Daffodil's Dreams. We pray for those who suffer in wars and natural disasters and for those who seek to help. Amen. This is Deacon Jim's last meeting with us this evening. So I would like to say a personal thank you to Jim for being my chaplain during my mayoral year and for offering prayers at each of our council meetings. Thank you, Jim. Please be seated. Good evening, everyone. I will just read through some housekeeping prior to tonight's business. We are not expecting a fire drill. Therefore, if one sounds, please can you follow officers who will lead you to the nearest fire exit, and we will gather at the assembly point on Believe Square. Officers will assist members of the public in the gallery. Can I remind members of the need to respect each other, and I will continue to chair these meetings fairly and to show impartiality. Members of the public are welcome, but should be aware that should they, in, they should not interrupt the proceedings as disruptions may result in removal from the public gallery. The rules of conduct of the meeting have been circulated in advance of the meeting and copies are available on your desks. Apologies for absence. Yeah, tonight we have apologies from Councillor Briley, Crosby, Evans, Galligan, Holland, Hurst, Marshall, O'Brien, Wakefield, Wilkinson and Councillor Talbot. Are there any further apologies? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Item two on the agenda. Minutes of the meeting held on the 1st of March, 2023. I will move the acceptance of the minutes as a correct record. Leader, do you wish to second? Can I put the minutes to the vote? All those in favour of accepting the minutes, please show. Any against? Any abstentions? Thank you. The minutes of the meeting are accepted. Mayor's announcements. I am aware that I will get an opportunity at the meeting in May to say some thank yous. However, for some of you here tonight, this will be your final meeting. Therefore, I would like to take this opportunity to say a few thank yous. I would like to thank the charity committee and everyone who has supported my charity, Daffodil's Dreams, over the past year, including everyone who attended the Mayor's Ball at Killay Court. I also want to take this opportunity to thank the staff who have supported me in this role over the past year, in particular, Democratic Services. And finally, I would like to thank you all in the Chamber for the wonderful job that you do in representing your constituents to the best of your ability during your time here at these meetings. Mayor's Charity Kitty Wake Canal Trip. This will take place on the evening of Friday the 21st of April. Please contact Councillor Ron Conway if you're interested in buying some tickets. The death of Honorary Alderman and former Councillor and Mayor Audrey Bennett. It is with deep regret that I refer to the death of Honorary Alderman Audrey Bennett on the 11th of March 2023. 
Audrey was first elected to Wigan Metropolitan Borough Council in 1977, representing the Abram Ward. In May 1989, she made history and was installed as the First Lady Mayor for Wigan Metropolitan Borough. During her time, she served on most committees as an ex officio capacity as Mayor, but she was a long-standing member of the Highways and Works and Planning and Development Committees, later called the Development Control, and became Vice Chair of the Planning Committee. Audrey was a school governor at Platbridge, County Primary, sorry, Platbridge Community Primary School, Abram Bringate Primary, and Low Hall County Primary Schools. Audrey represented the council on a number of outside organisations, including the Greater Manchester Passenger Transport Authority, Asylum Seekers Provider Forum, Douglas Valley Joint Committee, now disestablished, and Platbridge Community Centre, and gave valuable service to the council and to the community at large. Audrey stepped down from her role as a councillor in, in 2008, but was appointed as an honorary alderman of the borough in October later that year. Her funeral took place on Monday the 3rd of April 2023 at Abram Parish Church. And on behalf of the council, I have written to those closest to Audrey to extend the council's deepest sympathy for the sad loss that they have sustained. Do any members wish to speak? Councillor Smethurst. Dispute this um, because Audrey was a very special friend. But Audrey was my colleague in Abram Ward for 12 years. Just trying to find a word that would describe Audrey was difficult. I found it impossible to define Audrey in just one word that would describe her. After much trying, the nearest I came was she was energetic, dynamic and assertive. Audrey was very loud, not only in voice but in personality. She did not mind telling you what she thought. She used to say that these qualities had come about with her selling fish at Wigan Market. She called herself a typical fishwife. Audrey was never ashamed of giving herself this description, but was very proud of the fact that she had come from selling fish to be the first citizen of Wigan Borough when she took on the role of mayor. Audrey was never backward in coming forward and after one council meeting, she had words with one of the officers at that time, Bob Saunders, about something that was troubling her in the ward. Audrey went on for quite some time telling Bob about the problem. Then the word tranquilments came out. I could see Bob Saunders' face cloud over as he'd no idea what Audrey was talking about. After a while, I had to ask Audrey to explain to Bob what tranquilments meant. A discussion took place about whether this was an actual word. Audrey was adamant that it was. Just to prove her point, Audrey then went away and looked up tranquilments. And yes, it is a word. It's from the black country and it's meaning trinkets, bits and bobs. So if you're ever wanting to describe something in your ward, please use the word tranquilments and think of Audrey. After that, it became a standing joke between us that if we needed anything describing within the ward, we always used the word tranquilments. The council moved from the old town hall in 1990 to where we are now. Audrey had one seat at the back, which is now occupied by Councillor Barry Taylor. We have all moved to different seats within the council chamber but Audrey insisted that that was her seat, refusing to move to any other within the chamber. Audrey only left that seat when she retired in 2008. It would be nice to put something on that seat that reminds us of a long-serving woman councillor. There is one thing that you could say about Audrey, and that is whether in her personal life or as a councillor, she was Labour through and through. Thank you.
Councillor Carl Sweeney. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and, um, and thank you to, to my war colleague, Eunice, who um, I, I did wonder I was going to weave tranquillments into this conversation because I was another one that was totally flummoxed by what that meant uh, and had to have it explained to me. But, but I wanted to speak um, this evening about, about Audrey. I had the real privilege of, of working alongside Audrey, sadly for only quite a short time. I only got onto the council myself in, in 2003 and has been described. She retired in 2008. Um, and I, I always remember Audrey's being a, a big personality with a big voice, but she was incredi incredibly kind, incredibly considerate, really passionate about doing the best that she, the best that she could for the residents of, of Abram Ward. And, and one of the abiding memories for me was as a new councillor aged 27, which sadly is still quite young by, by, the, by today's standards as well. Audrey very much took me under her wing, um, but in a way not to tell me what I needed to do, but to share with me that collective experience and that life experience that Audrey brought to the role. And I was forever grateful for that because like any job or any role, if you get a, a great mentor um, and a great friend who can support you, then it really does help. And I look back really fondly to, to, to many of the things that myself and, and, and uh, Eunice and Audrey worked on. And even though Audrey was a strong personality, she had lots of opinions and you always knew where you stood with her. I, I can't recall one occasion where the three of us were, were falling out. If we disagreed, we talked about it. There was a real team ethos that, that she very much led and we've continued ever, ever since. And so I, I just wanted to summarise to say, you know, it was an absolute privilege to work with Audrey. She did so much for the communities that she represented. And when she stood down in 2008, um, so something went missing. And I can only describe it as that, that personality, that big presence. Um, and and I, I look back fondly still to this day about those, the time that I, I worked alongside her. And, um, yeah, and I just wanted to, you know, pass on my, my uh, condolences to John and the rest of the family at, at this difficult time for them. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councillor Mark Aldred. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Um, I, I had to stand up today, really, just to say a few words about Audrey, because um, back in 2004, I got on transport. I'd only been a councillor for three years at that point, and I got, got the pleasure of representing Wigan there. And I was a little nervous, I, you know, I'll openly admit. Audrey told me what time my train was. She got on at Wigan, I got on at Atherton, told me to make sure I was there on time, and she was always there with a seat for me. I was that nervous, she said to me, if you just follow me and you'll learn quickly. But I didn't realise she didn't just mean theoretically, she actually meant practically as well. Because when we got off the train there at Wigan, we always went one way going to the meetings. Coming back, we always came via Marks and Spencers. Always. So much so after four years when, when she retired from transport, I still walked back via Marks and Spencers for at least two years after that. But... Um, my condolences to John and the family. Sorry I couldn't make uh, the funeral, but I was aware. But um, she meant a lot to us, us all. Um, she was always straight. She was always direct. And as a new councillor, as well as an old one, um, you appreciated that. Thank you very much. Councillor David Molyneux. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Obviously, I knew Audrey over a number of years. When I got elected uh, in 82, Audrey was at the forefront of people who welcomed me into the chamber uh, because we had neighbouring wards. But Audrey, every description that you've heard today sums Audrey up. But Audrey was a giant in terms of her political beliefs and what she stood for. And I can honestly tell you, Madam Mayor, she'd be so proud of the fact that there was a woman sat in that chair here tonight for this meeting. Being the first mayor, woman mayor of Wigan meant so much to Audrey. And Audrey was very much a force to be reckoned with. I've just got to make an apology, actually, Madam Mayor, because I referred, I thought Audrey had gone to the Wigan and St. Helens final, where Wigan absolutely battered St. Helens. 
but she didn't. She was the mare when Wigan played Warrington. And as Paul Kenny will remember, Wigan absolutely battered Warrington as well <laughs> that day, which certainly put a big smile on, on Audrey's face, I'm sure. But she was, uh, she, she led from the front. One thing about Audrey, if she had something to say, she said it. She didn't hold back. She didn't say anything behind your back. She'd say it to your face because Audrey was that type of person. And I think back to the miners' strike of 84, when Audrey was a giant in terms of standing up for the mining communities, not just the one that she represented, but across this borough. And along with a lot of other miners' wives, they made such a big difference in the support that they gave, not just to their husbands and partners, but to the communities they represented. And I did mention it at the funeral. In a mural year, Margaret Thatcher decided to visit Wigan for whatever strange reason. Unfortunately for Margaret Thatcher, Audrey was the mayor of Wigan at that time. And I'm sure if I could have printed tickets and sold tickets, we'd have certainly filled out the DW Stadium because that was the meeting and that was the visit you wanted to be at. Not to see Margaret Thatcher, but to see how hard Audrey angled Margaret Thatcher. Now, I don't know whether Audrey remembers that, remembered that visit, but I can tell you something, I bet Margaret Thatcher never forgot it. <laughs> she would have certainly got her side of the story over uh, very forcibly. Can I just say to the family who were here tonight, she was certainly someone that we all loved. And like I said at the funeral, thank you for sharing Audrey with us. Because I do know that when a partner stands shoulder to shoulder with a person in this chamber, it makes them a better person. And I know that John, Gary, Paul and the rest of the family meant so much to her. So thank you from me and thank you from everybody in this chamber who knew Audrey. It was a pleasure, it was a delight to be in her company and she'll be sadly missed by us all. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I would now like to ask all members who are able to stand to please stand for a minute as a mark of respect for Honorary Alderman Audrey Bennett. Thank you. Please be seated. Item four on the agenda, declarations of interest. The monitoring officer has provided to all members the relevant guidance and if this has been issued. Members are asked to consider relevant interests for the purpose of this meeting and if there are any interests declared, members must leave the room during the relevant item. Please fill out the forms on your agenda and return this to Democratic Services Officers at the end of the meeting. Item 5 on the agenda, Mayoral. I invite the Leader to move a recommendation. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd like to move uh, Councillor Debbie Parkinson. And I'd like to ask this council to agree that Councillor Debbie Parkinson is a fit and proper person to become the Deputy Mayor of the Metropolitan Borough of Wigan for the next municipal year. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Is the recommendation seconded? 
Do any other members wish to contribute? All those in favour of Councillor Debbie Parkinson being nominated as Deputy Mayor for 2023-24, please show your hands. Thank you. Members should know that this appointment is subject to her re-election and council approval at the annual general meeting to be held on the 24th of May, 2023. Item six on the agenda. Members not seeking re-election in May, 2023. On behalf of the council and the people of the borough, I would like to acknowledge the contributions of those members who are not seeking re-election and offer our thanks to councillors Mark Aldred, Steve Dorber, Stephen Evans, Terry Halliwell, Stephen Hellier, Lynn Holland, Billy Rotherham, and councillor Sweeney, councillor Carl Sweeney. In placing on record the councillor's appreciation of their service of these four mem members, I invite other members to say a few words. Councillor Paul Kenny. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I'm sure that uh, members present tonight pr probably worked out already that we have two wards tonight where we actually have two members representing those wards are actually uh, stepping down and retiring from the authority. In particular, I wanted to talk about the Worsley Mains ward where two of my colleagues, Councillor Billy Rotherham and Councillor Lynn Holland, will be stepping down tonight. And I know that Lynn's not with, with us tonight, but I just want to place on my record to, to her uh, for a, the way in which she carried out her duties as a local ward councillor diligently and promoting the interests of her constituents while she served on this authority. I know that from time to time Lynn has suffered with ill health, but I know she always tried her best on behalf of the residents that she was elected to represent, and I wish her well for the future, Madam Mayor. Uh, that leaves me to turn to uh, my friend, Councillor Billy Rotherham. Uh, like many of us, Billy's entrance into the Labour Party came from his industrial background. And as a, uh, a worker at Ford's uh, in Liverpool, uh, Billy found that he had the, the gift of the gab and that he could speak up and represent workers. And it was very much that interest uh, in the industrial landscape that brought him into the Labour Party here in Wigan. And it didn't take long for Billy to get involved and to start uh, speaking up on behalf of residents. And he was elected in 1994. And that's some time ago, isn't it, Madam Mayor? And he's been elected every time since that election uh, in 1994 with thumping majorities, which I think is testament to the uh, manner in which Billy is thought of in, in that area. Uh, Billy really did hit the ground running when he was first elected, and he, he recognised that there were some, a number of issues in Worsley Mains that needed to be addressed, one of which was that there was no real community base in the area, and he lobbied very hard for a community facility, or a community hub as we now call them nowadays, and he was successful in, in persuading the authority and securing funding to turn the former St. James School building into what is now Clifton Street Community Centre. And for those of you that may not know Clifton Street Community Centre, it really is a fantastic facility for the people of Worsley Mains and Hawkley Hall. And it's no, it, it is in no small feat that uh, Billy was responsible for delivering that facility and I know that it, it means a lot to him today to see that the facility is still flourishing. He wasn't just content to deal with matters around community facilities. He soon became a school governor as well and at the Worsley Mains Community Primary. And he soon saw for himself the terrible state in which those school buildings were. And he immediately made it his intent to do something about that. Billy was able to bring on side the then MP and cabinet minister Ian McCartney and he persuaded Ian of the real necessity for that school to be rebuilt. 
no mean feat to persuade the cabinet minister, but Ian took that back to Westminster. And because of Billy's perseverance as a, as a school governor and as a ward member, the funding was secured to rebuild that school. And that school, I think, has transformed the life chances of many children over the years because of the fantastic facilities that it now provides. Not content with that, Madam Mayor, there is more. Billy also, he worked hard to deliver Chandler House, a fantastic health facility also for the people of, in that area. Billy also uh, was the mayor of this borough in 2013 alongside Janet, who I know is, uh, he's extremely proud to be with. Uh, and in between all of that, he even found time to have a, a triple heart bypass and heart valve replacement. So I think it just goes to show, as he said to me, it, don't, it doesn't just keep his heart ticking, even if it is a little louder than it used to be. Uh, now, there's not many 76-year-olds who are as sprightly as Billy, and he often takes to the football pitch playing walking football. And uh, unbeknown to him, I actually have with me today his runners-up medal in the National Walking Football Association uh, Cup final that he participated in only last year in September, where he was a runner-up. So... I just hope when I get to Billy's age that I've got that sort of energy. So on behalf of the local authority, on behalf of everybody here, Billy, I just want to wish you all the best in your retirement. I know that our paths will still cross, we'll still keep in touch, and I'm sure that uh, you and Janet will have an enjoyable time. So it's a fond farewell from us, but thank you for your service and for being a tremendous ambassador, not just for your ward, but for the people of this borough. Thank you. Councillor Eunice Smethurst. Thank you, Madam Mayor, fellow councillors. Carl has been my colleague for the past 20 years, not only as a councillor, but as a very close friend. During that time, we've got to know one another and our families quite well. I know I can speak for Councillor Martin Smethurst. It's just been a great pleasure working with Cal. And I know work commitments, family life and council have made it difficult to fulfil all roles required. Although Cal has not moved house, this is something quite unusual. He's not only left us as Abram Ward and Makerfield constituents, but he's moved over to Wigan con consti constituency and into Ince Ward, and he's also moved MPs from Yvonne Favag over to Lisa Nande, and this is all through uh, boundary changes. So I don't think this will ever be done again, where he's, he's, he's made a complete change altogether. We wish Carl and his family all the best, and I do hope that in the near future, when life balance changes, that he will consider coming back onto the council as he has made a difference to all the council roles he has undertaken. Good luck for the future, and all the very best. Councillor Edward Halton. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'd like to thank all councillors that are standing down or standing again. We... We'll probably never see eye to eye, but I am positive that we all are doing our best for our wards and, and residents as a whole. I would like to speak about two people, Billy and, uh, and Stephen. Obviously, I, was, I started here in 2006, and I don't think I ever spoke to Billy until I got into license and regulation, and I found him to be one of the nicest, decent people I've ever met. Thank you for the time we spent together. Um, turning to Stephen, it's been an honour and a privilege to um, act for Stephen. Uh, in this time, he's, as you know, he's, he's, he's quite religious and he's got a, a lot of work to do in his church. He spends most of his time on a plane travelling around the world, um, going to uh, new churches that have been set up. And unfortunately, he has to, that's a priority for him. 
quite reasonably and he needs to spend more time looking after his flock uh, as, a, as a whole and not just, the, not just his ward. But it, it's been an honour and privilege to, uh, to serve um, for him and for you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Barry Taylor. Councillor Keith Cunliffe. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I can't miss this uh, opportunity to just say a few words about Terry Halliwell. Terry came on to this council about 24 years ago now, and um, he and I hit it off with a close friendship right from the very start. By the time Terry was working at Wigan Lee College, he was, uh, he worked uh, training young people on construction skills, bricklaying particularly. Uh, and I got on cabinet just before Terry and uh, Terry always used to say to me, what's going on in cabinet? I said, well, I know what's going on in my portfolio, but no, no, it must be. And then a few years later, he got on cabinet and he said to me, you're right, you don't know everything that's going on, you only know what your bit. And um, so Terry was a regular in the cabinet uh, office. And we used to, every Monday morning, we'd have the rundown of Terry's weekend. <laughs> and it took some time to tell. Councillor Hunt was involved in some of those stories, <laughs> none of which I can repeat in this chamber. Uh, but, but Terry, if anything, was conscientious, looked it very carefully into his portfolio and really played an active part in any work he had to do. Um, and over the last 20 odd years, Terry and I, in a way, have mentored each other and supported each other on many occasions uh, and in many things. And, and there was a period when um, Joe Platt was a member of the cabinet and the three of us virtually shared a desk in the cabinet office. Now, and we started to call each other the three amigos because the banter that went on between us was, was great and really uh, sort of built up. Uh, I remember one time Terry was, uh, I can't remember, I think I sort of had a back pain or something and Terry said, what you need is dog oil. Dog oil, I'd never heard of dog oil. And I thought it was just something Terry had made up. And uh, it was Terry's answer to everything. What you need, if you're not so well, you need dog oil. If you've got an ache and a pain, you need dog oil. And I thought, this is just Terry winding her up. And then he brought some dog oil in. And it's in the cabinet office now. He said to us yesterday, he said, I'll leave the dog oil here for you if anybody needs it. So Terry's been a great servant. All his, whatever portfolio he's had, He's devoted his time and commitment to it with a lot of energy. And so he'll be sadly missed. And he was telling us about fighting all-out elections, because the last all-out elections were in 2004. So he was telling us, you know, all-out elections are coming up, and he was telling us about fighting them. And I said, you never fought an all-out election. In 2004, he was elected uncontested. And he said to me, what happened was... The Tories thought the Liberals were going to put three candidates up and the Liberals thought the Tories were going to put three candidates up and neither of them put candidates up. So the only nominations for, for Terry's seat at that time were three Labour nominations. And the only bit he had to do was come in this chamber and pull out of a hat who got four years, who got three years and who got two years. So he's never fought an all-out election. Um, but... I'll, I'll miss Terry. I'll miss him for the fun that we had uh, and the hard work that we did as well. So, having said that about Terry, I'd just say a couple of words about Steve Dorber. Steve Dorber is the only person who served two terms as mayor in this chamber since the inception of the council. And I think everybody who was here at at the time, and it's not all that long ago, will acknowledge what a great mayor he was, 
his fairness, the way he conducted the meetings uh, was absolutely brilliant. And he served us well. During this time as mayor, I, um, I got to go to Angers with Steve. And can I say, he made that a really enjoyable couple of days. He's great company to be with. He's a dry wit, is perhaps the best I can describe it, but wonderful company, a brilliant mayor, and the only person, and likely to be the only person, ever to serve two terms as the mayor of this borough. He's been a great councillor for his ward. He's been a great contribu contributor to this council, and the way he's performed his duties has been exemplary. So thanks, Steve. Councillor, Councillor Kevin Anderson. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. We, we are certainly um, losing the service of some great characters and dedicated uh, councillors um, in May, and I uh, obviously wish everybody well in the new lives of, of their retirement. But I just want to say a few words about Mark Aldred. Um, I mean, I've known Mark for over 20 years now, and. I remember when he was first elected to this chamber in December 2001 in a by-election for the Hangsford Ward. And he stood a couple of times previously and successfully. Um, the elections in that part of the borough at the time were, let's say, rough and could get a bit nasty and personal. But Mark and his family did not sink to this level. And I really want to thank him uh, and his family for playing a significant part in eliminating the Lib Dem presence from this council chamber. Mark was appointed as a Wigan Council representative in Transport for Greater Manchester in 2004 and, subs and subsequently became chair, overseeing the implementation of the much-needed Lee Gaddy Busway. Mark was also chair of the Children's Services Scrutiny Committee for a time as well. I think Mark's also uh, well known for his charity work over several decades, raising money for charity, uh, but often there's charities dressing up as Santa at uh, near Christmas time. Um, he's also runs a dementia charity where he created the Guardian Angel devices to help people when they're out on their own. He's also designed a locking system that will help people living with dementia live, up, live in their own homes for longer uh, with the backing of the National Health Service. I do wish to thank Mark for his over, 20, over 22 years of dedicated service to the residents of his ward and to this council. I wish you, Mark, all the best and your family for the future. Thank you. Councillor Nazia Raymond. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to pay tribute to my board colleague, my mentor, and my very special friend, Steve Halil. I've known Steve uh, since I got selected as a candidate in Tilsley in December 2015. Since then, Steve has been a great support and help to me. When I look back, to 2016, winning Tilsley was a challenging task, but I was very lucky to have Steve as my agent, and it was his hard work and planning that made it possible for us to win the seat. When I was selected, elected, I was still a political novice. I was overexcited, impatient, and always ready to jump into action, but Steve was always there to quell my excitement and rush with his wisdom, realism, and extensive experience. Steve, I will always be very grateful for the way you helped me channelize my genuine but raw ideology and passion and helped me take a more rational approach to issues. Steve has served in this council for 22 years. He has an extraordinary ability to stay calm and focused whatever the situation is. Steve is very well respected, and it goes without saying that he is appreciated for his hard work and commitment by the residents in Tilsley and his colleagues in this chamber equally. I have always seen Steve leading from the front, whatever the issue is, big or small, neutral or controversial. 
Steve's attention to detail, and his forensic approach to get everything perfect is second to none. Steve has served in many key positions. He has been the vice chair of planning committee for a long time, and I know how proud he was in this role. And then he was appointed the chairman of the planning regulation and licensing committee, and he took that role very seriously and with pride. Steve, I want to thank you for the work you've done for people over the years, and especially the friendship that I share with you, and I hope it will continue. Steve, you will be missed, and I wish you all the best for your retirement. Thank you. Councillor Stuart Gerrard. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Just, uh, I won't be, be so long. Uh, I'd just like to thank all councillors who are standing down tonight uh, for their efforts in their communities. Uh, depending on what side of the chamber you're on, I think we all stand to represent our constituents and do that to our best of our ability. Uh, but I'd also like to thank Councillor Elliot uh, for his guidance on the planning committee when I first joined that back in 2018. Uh, keep me to one side and give me a few pointers. It was only a small planning meeting, I remember. It was the A49 Link Road. I think my, my very first uh, planning committee, I thought I said, I'll, I'll abstain probably on this and uh, see how it goes. Anyway, I ended up voting against it. And I think that's how, how the trend carried on, I think, <laughs> Steve, didn't it, from then on. Uh, yeah, but thank you for your, your time, Steve. It was much appreciated on the planning committee. And uh, you'll be sorely missed on that. Uh, Councillor Darber, same again as uh, the Deputy Leader said. Two, two terms as mayor, and I think we all looked to you for guidance during that, that time, and it was much appreciated. Uh, so once again, thank you for all who are standing down this time, and hopefully we can have a, a drink afterwards at some point. Thank you. Councillor George Davis. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Well, I'd like to echo what everybody's been saying. I've known all the people who retiring all the years which I've been here, and also to thank every one of you who's done a fantastic service. But can I just mention that, first of all, about Mark. I remember we did, we did a walk, actually, from Lee to Wigan, if you remember, for your Merce charity, and it was absolutely brilliant. Uh, we kept going into the pub, seeing if we could get a little bit of money from them, you know, and whatever. But it was a fantastic day. So thank you very much for your service, Mark. Bill, well, I don't know. The thing is, this guy is a real comedian because we all know that. But the actual, the actual work, what he did, and again, I remember when Bill came up to Swinley Ward when he was the mayor, and if you remember, Bill, we opened up the little community centre for the children up there, and it was a fantastic day. So all our residents in Swinley still say, oh, it is, you know, Bill Rotherham. So thank you very much. And then over to this guy, because Steve, I've worked with Steve for many, many years, but also we have also thank him for the work he does in the community yet. And I know that in the future, he's still going to be working in the community. So I feel also that from the, the group which I'm working with at Allgate House, would like to thank you personally for the work what you've done for them over the last couple of months. But I do know that you'll be working alongside other groups in Wigan for the future. So. The rest of the, uh, the team, thank you very much. But thank you very much for, you know, a fantastic time of being a councillor and being part of the community of Wigan Borough. Thank you. Councillor David Molyneux. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Obviously, I've got a story to tell about each and every one, but that would take too long. Uh, it made me smile when we talked about Steve and he's 
two terms as mayor. And, and the deputy leader spoke about his time in the chamber. Well, he didn't spend a lot of time in the chamber, if you remember, <laughs> because we did a lot on virtual. And the one thing I will always remember, Steve, your first meeting as mayor on a virtual council meeting, the town hall got struck with lightning. <laughs> so that's one that you can always say that you chaired the meeting that the town hall got struck with lightning. And uh, it, it was certainly a, an amusing time uh, because there was another member in the council uh, building who I think it nearly struck, but uh, no, he got away with it. Uh, can I just say, for, for each and every one of them, uh, it's been a pleasure to work alongside them, from, from Mark, from Billy, from Steve, from Carl. I, I'm just looking around, and, and, and even Steve Evans, you know, I've got, to, I've got to say to Steve why he's been with the Chamber. He's always trying to be level-headed and put things forward, and I did read recently, he's even been telling Rishi Sunak where the government's going wrong, so I knew there was something about him, uh, and that's probably one, a, a very good point. But a very good friend of mine, and my vice chair for quite a while, was, was Steve Hellier on planning. And, and believe you me, there are times when your chair of planning, a vice chair of planning, you feel like your backs are against the wall. Uh, and I was privileged to, uh, to go to a planning conference with Steve at, at Oxford. Uh, uh, and that in itself was an experience I'll never forget, Steve. Uh, and, and Steve, one thing I will tell you, you can stand on his head. It's not something I've ever done when I've drank too much, but Steve is pretty good at it. Uh, and the other thing is, we actually sat on the bench where Inspector Morse died in front of when we were in Oxford, because that brings back memories. And, and like I said with Billy, I, I could go on all day about Billy. But the special one is also is, is, is Terry Alliwell. And the conversations, when they talk about the three amigos, I sat in the fourth seat trying to keep control of these four people and the banter that used to take place. And the person I did feel sorry for was Susan Loudon, who was fanatical about Richard, Richard III, wasn't yeah. it? And Terry went into great detail how Richard III was a wrong one. And she said, you, he said, you only have to look at his picture to tell that. And Susan used to get quite upset, but, but, but Terry was a, an expert on history, as we all know. And if you think that the, vice, the deputy leader could speak for a long while on, on social care, Choose your time to pick to Terry about heritage because he would keep you there all day and all night because he's fanatical on it and he's made such a difference in terms of what, of what we're doing uh, as a council on heritage. And obviously Paul mentioned Lynn Holland and I'm, being, I'm saying Lynn last because Lynn has suffered uh, for quite a while now with ill health and to carry on this job when you're feeling fit and well is a difficult enough task. But to carry on a job when you're not feeling fit and well, it's even harder. So can I just say to each and every one of them, thank you. Because tonight we're probably losing well over 100 years of service to this authority and the people of this borough. And that in itself is a significant loss to this council. And I hope whoever takes their places will carry on the good work that these people have done and make sure that the people that elect them they represent to the best of their ability. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Can I thank all of these members for their time and commitment to the Council?
Thank you. So we're up to item seven on the agenda. Um, update from cabinet portfolio holders. I now invite the relevant cabinet portfolio holders to deliver their updates. Okay, Madam Mayor, thank you. Um, perhaps a good job, Councillor Evans isn't here because he doesn't like me getting political in this chamber. He doesn't think we should have political debates in here. So I didn't want to upset him, but I was pleased that he recognised at the budget meeting that he was a bit frustrated with his government and perhaps a little embarrassed as well. Because what I've told you on many occasions, the situation in, in social care, in adult social care, with the number of vacancies and the issues around recruitment and retention. And so I was really pleased at the last meeting, the budget meeting, that when you think of those people who work in the care industry and, and care settings, three years ago, probably three years ago this month, those people in the care homes were going into work caring for people with COVID who'd been sent out of hospital without checks, were caring for them while they were dying, with about a thousand deaths a day, concerned about their own health and well-being and their families, but going into work, most of them on national minimum wage. National minimum wage, which means there's nobody earns less than them. It's the absolute minimum that can be paid. And so at that last meeting, I was really pleased and I'm proud that this council has, has, has decided this year that we will pay all care workers real living wage as a minimum. Now, at that budget meeting, to be quite honest, I didn't expect the Conservative groups to support that budget, which had many good things, but in particular, I think that was a really important move to make, giving care workers foundation living wage. And so I wasn't surprised that the Tories didn't support it. You know, I think they think everybody should be on national minimum wage who's, work, who's a worker. Um, but I was disappointed with some other members of this council. But the Tory group I expected, the independent group, if you can call it a group, um, one abstained, two actually voted with us for the budget, and three voted against, voted with the Tory group. And those were the three Abbotton Tory tribute bands. Like all tribute bands, not as famous and wealthy as the original, but they sing the same songs regularly. The Tories have kept quiet about it and accepted the decision. But what I find particularly disappointed is that Tory like Tory tribute band from Abbotton decide to put on that they don't feel that the council taxpayer should be paying for those workers to have the real living wage. Doesn't think the council taxpayer should subsidise private companies, bear in mind that 51 of the 52 care homes are private. Well, I've got news for them. The council have to pay the care fees of everybody in a care home who has less than £23,500 in savings. Can I tell you, there's a lot of people in, in this borough who have less than £23,500 savings. So the council has to pay that. What this was an opportunity to do, so we pay the <coughs> private company. What this was an opportunity to do was give them a little bit more on the proviso that they pay the real living wage. And that was right to do. And quite honestly, I was disappointed by that group of people echoing the Tory view and supporting the Tory policy and questioning why we should not pay the 
care workers found based in living wage, and particularly why the council taxpayer should not. Never ever have they criticised the fact that the Tories over a number of years have put an adult social care precept for the people of this borough to play, pay for social care here. They've done it all the time and they've never said a word about it. So we know where they stand. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Might be slightly less political than that last one, but here we go. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased to announce that uh, we, we've agreed to uh, place a star in Believe Square uh, for the Wigan Youth Zone, uh, which has done some exceptional and valuable work for this borough over the last 10 years, and how 10 years, 10 years flies. And in fact, there's nobody in the chamber tonight, but certainly people who were sat over there at the time spoke against the Wigan Youth Zone and voted against the Wigan Youth Zone. But all I can say is that I think every one of us in this chamber tonight fully accepts and understands the fantastic work that Wigan Youth Zone has done for a number of years now, particularly for young people from all across this borough and who are now working closely with working with young people at the New Lee Youth Hub. And I think it's only right that we should acknowledge the fantastic work that's taking place and the number of young people's lives who have been changed and turned around because of the work of the staff and the volunteers involved in Wigan Youth Zone. And I'm sure this council will fully agree that we support that by presenting a star in acknowledgement of the work that they do in this borough. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Item 8A on the agenda, Local Authority Governor's Report. The Council has requested to approve the nominations for governors, for governor vacancies, and the reappointments set out on the report on page 28 of the agenda. I invite Councillor Bullen to move the recommendations. Councillor Bullen. I uh, beg to uh, move the recommendations. Are the recommendations seconded? Leader, do you wish to speak now or reserve your right to speak until later in the debate? Do any other members wish to contribute? Leader? No, I'm, up, I'm happy with that, Madam Mayor, for the vote to be taken. Councillor Bolland, do you wish to sum up? All those in favour of accepting the recommendations as set out in the report? Any against? Any abstentions? Thank you, the vote is carried. Item 8B, review of the special responsibility allowances for members appointed to the Greater Manchester Combined Authority, GMCA, Overview and Scrutiny Committees. The Council has requested to consider the report set out on page 31 of the agenda and to approve several recommendations as outlined on, the pa on page 32 of the report. I invite the Leader to move the recommendations. Leader? Happy to move, Madam Mayor. Are the recommendations seconded? Thank to second, Madam Mayor. Deputy Leader, do you wish to speak now or reserve your right to speak until later in the debate? Do any other members wish to contribute? Leader, do you wish to sum up? No, happy to move the report again, Madam Mayor. Thank you. All those in favour of accepting the recommendations as set out in the report? Any against? Any abstentions? Thank you, that vote has been carried. 
Item nine on the agenda, questions and comments. Councillor Davis wishes to make a comment in relation to the Confident Places Scrutiny Committee meeting, uh, sorry, committee minutes of the 1st of February and the 22nd of March, 2023. Councillor Davis. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I would like to take this opportunity to pay tribute to our fantastic environment teams who work hard in all weather conditions to keep our borough cleaner, safer and greener. The work undertaken by our street scene, waste collection and other environmental teams is not glamorous and is often not recognised by some, but is of a vital importance to keeping our borough looking at its best. The work requires true dedication to clear litter and fly tipping from our streets on open spaces which cost £4 million per year to remove and dispose of money which could be spent on education or health and social care. Our award-winning street scene team boasts four green flag parks and have been recognised by the RHS judges as the best in the North West for our Bloom programme. One example of the work undertaken by Environment was that during the recent Our Town programme, 25 district centres saw works carried out that involved the following. 18,000 square metres of jet washing, over 270 new bins installed, 41 grot spots cleaned, over 80 tonnes of litter, fly tipping and debris removed, engagement with over 1,400 businesses, 62 miles of road and footways swept, 312 lighting columns painted to prolong their life. Our street scene team are also carrying out the Weed It Out programme to, rem to remove weeds from major routes throughout the borough. Our waste collection team is responsible for emptying over 200,000 domestic bins weekly along with operating a bulky waste collection service. The service also operates a farm round for refuge and recycling collections which services 1,662 properties and the Euro round collects an additional 706 containers, including high-rise blocks of flats and masonettes. The Environmental Education and Enforcement Service is made up of teams who all part their who all play their part in serving our residents. Our parking services team keep our residents and visitors to the borough safe by promoting safe parking. When required, our environmental enforcement teams take action against the people who blight our communities by committing environmental crime and services teams ensure that the food we eat is safe and that our elderly and vulnerable residents are protected from doorstep criminals and rogue traders. Our CCTV staff work 24 seven to keep people safe with strong partnerships with GMP, which has led to many crimes being solved. Finally, our network management team keep our streets and airways well maintained and have recently won an award from the apps for the street, street lighting innovation. They also ensure that when we wake up to a very cold or snowy morning, that our roads are being gritted and are safe for us all to use. All of these teams play an important part in providing a cleaner, safer, greener borough. And I would like to thank them all today. But Madam Mayor, I would like to ask all councillors and officers in the meeting tonight to show the appreciation to all our environmental teams and all of the work groups in our borough. A big thank you with a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments, Councillor Davis. Councillor Gerard wishes to ask two questions. Councillor Gerard, can you ask your first question, please? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, seeing as Councillor Cunliffe used this platform, I think I'll use mine for a couple of minutes if you, if you be 
Hello, Mitty. Tory Light. Calling us Tory Light Party and then describes what an a good independent should be, that we can all vote different ways and vote with our conscience. Oh, here we go. And then he goes on about that we voted against carers. He may not know this, but my wife's been a carer for the last 15 years, working socially. Councillor Jared, can you ask your okay, question, please? That, considering it was supposed to be a portfolio update, it turned into a bit of an attack. And he's not got the first clue about us to turn it off with, apart from uh, political bandstanding. Anyway, I'll crack on to the uh, question. The last budget meeting, there was quite a bit of talk about uh, Ashton not getting its levelling up fund. Obviously, now that has. Also in the budget, it stated about Addison having further funding. But obviously, Ashton at the time is having the levelling up fund. But now that Ashton has benefited from the levelling up fund, will the leader now agree that Addison, as it's the only other town of a master plan, will be put forward for the next round of the levelling up bid? Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask the leader or the relevant portfolio holder to respond, please? I'll respond to the question, Madam Mayor. Uh, can, I, can I first of all say that levelling up, there's not been actually an announcement that there'll be another round of a levelling up, unless you know something I don't. But there is no indication as yet there'll be a further round of levelling up. And what I also need to mention to you, and, and you're right, you represent others, I can understand your question. But you've got to understand also, it's based on constituency and support of the MP. Now I think you're in Bolton West, if I remember right, and the Bolton West MP is currently supporting the bid for West Orton. So that would make it extremely difficult to get the support of your MP for any bid for Atherton. And should you change constituency and end up in Lee, as yet, the MP from Lee has not supported the levelling up bid for Lee. So the possible chance of supporting the one from Atherton is slightly remote. But what I will say to you, if and when we get the further details of any levelling up bids, then we'll review all options available to us as a council. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councillor Gerard, can you ask your second question, please? Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. But a bit of a point of explanation. You might not, council, the leader might not know this. If the town straddles two MP boundaries, it needs the support. It, the MPs can support two bids. Oh, that's basically why that is. And we do, we do have support from both. Uh, my second question is uh, about potholes. In November 22, it was reported that Wigan uh, as a borough, it was the second lowest spend on our ways in transport in the country on, on potholes. And I think everyone can agree that their, their roads at the moment aren't up to scratch. Uh, so we, the question is basically, do we believe that the current policy, which is basically the debt required for these uh, and, and the location of some of these potholes is working? Because in some areas, it has to be more than 40 millimetres, uh, the pothole, but in areas where we've got high HGV traffic and heavy traffic, that needs to, I think, needs to be lowered to about 20 mil and, and to be referred near us straight away because they break up quite easily. And that, that's happening quite a lot all over the borough, as I know through my day job. Uh, so I'm going to agree that the uh, leader will agree with me that the policy needs to be re looked at and the uh, dimensions of the potholes, what we need to look at. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Councillor Gerard. Can I ask uh, the leader or the relevant portfolio holder to respond, please? Councillor Prescott. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor, in response to the question put by Councillor Gerard, the answer is yes. The policy for repairing infrastructure anomalies is working, it's working well. The latest information available to me is that the overall performance on completing minor repairs against service standard is at 95 percent with the number of repairs steady and that's despite the number of potholes having risen due to the prolonged period of cold weather which we've experienced during the winter months highways inspections have completed 100 percent of all planned highway inspections so far for the period 2022 
2023. Madam Mayor, with regard to highway plan maintenance, the monthly progress of our schemes is online. Madam Mayor, I would also like to point out that councils around the country have seen a significant increase in costs in carrying out repairs due in main to the increased cost of materials. Estimates shown an increase the cost of some 22% to repair potholes. The vast majority of road systems in our country are local roads, but the government spends something like 31 times more money in repairing motorways at a cost of some £192,000 per mile and a meagre £6,000 per mile on fixing potholes on local roads, which make up over 180,000 miles of the UK's road network. And given all of those factors, the service we provide is maintain, in maintaining our road system in this borough is extremely good. I, would expect, I wouldn't expect you to agree with this, Councillor Gerard, but you wouldn't, would you? Not just three, three weeks before our local election, and after all, that was the main purpose of the question in the first place, wasn't it? Before we move on to the uh, notices of motions, I'd like to request a short, com uh, a short comfort break. Can I ask members to be back, please, at 25 past seven? <laughs> Item 10 on the agenda, notice of, notice of motions. A motion has been submitted by Councillor Draper, which is set out on page 65 of the agenda. Councillor Draper? Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, for allowing to speak on this motion. In 2016, being elected as a Labour councillor to represent the Douglas Ward, I presented and requested full support for the WASPI motion to the full council in 2016. It was passed unanimously by this chamber. After the meeting, Jan Fulster, who is up in the gallery, uh, admin of the WASPI campaign in the early 2016 found that both WASPI groups in our borough have some great members, hard-working women who took the mantle and refused to give up. They are all a inspiration to me. In 2017, I was appointed as the WASPI champion on behalf of Wigan Council by the previous leader, the late Lord Smith, and then later endorsed by the present leader, Council Mullinex. As the WASPI champion, the only one in the country, I've supported our borough's two groups, Wigan and Makerfield Group and the Lee Group, who formed way back in 2015. <laughs> Both groups have led by example, attending rallies, hosting fundraising events, meeting MPs and councillors, holding monthly meetings and writing to the DWP, MPs, councillors, anybody who would listen. With both groups, I visited the House of Commons twice, once in 2018 with the Lee Waspy Group, and again in 2019 with Wigan and Makerfield Waspy Group. In 2019, we had the full support of the previous Labour leader. In fact, it was in the 2019 manifesto. That support will continue. Locally, this council has tirelessly supported our Waspy ladies via <laughs> press support, we have made videos of support. We have had the face painted and lit up purple. We have lit both Lee and Wigan Town Hall, showing our support for our 1950s born Waspy ladies and International Women's Day. We have helped with welfare advice, universal credit and other benefits. We continue to support the Waspy campaign. In fact, it is one of the Labour Group pledges in the 2023 local elections. Up and down the country, the WASPI campaign has cross-party support in most councils. Tonight, I will be asking you to support the leader, to write to the current Prime Minister, members of Parliament, the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions to support the WASPI campaign's demand for immediate, fast and fair compensation package to be paid to all 1950s born and WASPI ladies. To put things into context, 
I will give you some history about our 1950s born WASPy ladies campaign. WASPy stands for Women Against State Pension Inequality. In the 1995 Pensions Act, the government increased the state pension age for women from 60 to 65, with a further increase to 66 in 2011 Pensions Act. The change was not properly communicated to 3.8 million women born in the 1950s until 2012, giving some only one year's notice of a six-year increase in their anticipated retirement age. 18,000 of affected women are in our own Wigan Borough Authority area. The Parliamentary and Health Ombudsman, the PHSO, has found that the Department of Work and Pensions was guilty of maladministration in its angling of the state pension age increase for women born in the 1950s. The All Parliamentary Group of State Pension Inequality for Women has concluded that the impact of the WD, WP maladministration on the 1950s born women has been as devastating as it is widespread. The APPG believes the case for Category 6 injustice is overwhelming and clear. Women have had their emotional, physical, mental circumstances totally obliterated for the lack of reasonable notice. Research commissioned by the campaign group WASPE has found that at the end of the 2022, more than 220,000 1950s born women have died waiting for justice since the campaign began in 2015. WASPE figures show that over a course of a two year COVID pandemic, one in 10 women who died was affected by these uncommunicated changes and lost both their pension, income and the opportunity to make alternative retirement plans. Despite the Ombudsman's findings and the rapid death rate of those affected, the government is choosing now to wait for further reports before taking any action. This council believes this injustice not only a profound effect on the individuals involved, but on the wider community in the Wigan Borough and on local government, not least because women who would have looked after older relatives or partners are unable to do, afford to do so with a knock and effect and an impact on local social care. Women who would have retired and engaged in caring responsibilities for grandchildren are having to continue working, increasing the childcare burden on the state locally. Women who've been left in poverty are struggling to meet their housing costs with a knock and effect and impact on local housing stock. There is a broader impact on voluntary service of all kinds locally. We are missing out on able active volunteers who would have otherwise been able to retire from full work planned, from full time work as planned. Our economy is negatively affected by reducing spending power and disposable income. The uncommunicated state pension aid changes as the borough that among women bought in the 1950s. As such, the council supports a conclusion by the All Parliamentary Group on State Pension Inequality that women born in the 1950s had suffered a gross injustice, affecting their emotional, physical and mental circumstances, in addition to causing financial hardship. A swift resolution is ongoing injustice, but more and more women die waiting for compensation. The WASPIS campaign for an immediate one of compensation payment to those affected with the, with, with the most going to women who were the shortest notice and the longest increase in their step pension age. The WASPI campaign has won the case for the Ombudsman's decision to be reviewed, which is massive. This was a couple of weeks ago. The, cam the campaign raised over £1,000 to take the case to court. Councillor Wales, who's going to be speaking after me, will explain more when she speaks. Just get a drink of water. Yeah. 
I just want to say a few words as well. I mean, we have to thank the men for, from, who supported our women. They've done it from day one. That's husbands, grandsons, sons, nephews. They've all been there for our women. When you think about it, a lot of women went on universal credit. They went on universal credit because they don't even know what the benefit was. They was absolutely lost. And this is what these women have had to deal with time and time again. One of our ladies has three jobs, three. She's in her 60s now. She's got three jobs to survive and live. This is the reality that we actually have now. When I have two relatives recently who've died, who one of them had just got the state pension and died six months later. This is what we're dealing with here. We are here now to support our women because they are up there and they've worked for seven, eight years trying to get justice. And I will always support them and always will. To me, the WASPy women are the 21st century suffragette women fighting for justice. One woman, if you think about this, one woman dies every 30 minutes. So while we are sat in the chamber tonight, at the end of this meeting, there is going to be at least eight to 10 women who are going to die. This is the reality we're dealing with. These strong, determined women have my full support. And I can say, and I really mean this, we are not going away until we get justice. Therefore, I ask this chamber to unanimously support this motion. Thank you. Councillor Wales, do you wish to speak on the motion or reserve your right to speak until later in the debate? To speak on the motion, thank you. Um, and thank you, Madam Mayor, for giving me the opportunity to speak. And thanks also to Councillor Draper for your eloquent analysis of the support we, as a council, have committed to the WASPI campaign. As you have already stated, we are so proud to be the only council in the country to have a WASPI champion. Personally, I've been part of the WASPI campaign since 2015, and it has certainly had its ups and downs along the way. The WASPI campaign, unlike others, has never campaigned, campaigned for a full restitution of lost pension and benefits, as they know that would be impossible to fund. Every Sunday morning, when I help to moderate, the WASPI Facebook page, I'm reminded of the suffering of women from my generation. The stories are harrowing and reveal how many women are trying to desperately survive. A current theme is, why haven't we taken to the streets like the French? And it's hard to answer that one. But that has never been the WASPI way. We also do not allow any form of political harassment and our Facebook page is rigorously moderated to sift out any undignified attacks of a political nature. The campaign was one that was regarded in 2016 by Durham University as being highly effective. And yet, here we are in 2023 still fighting that Fight. The WASPI campaign took legal advice back near the beginning of the campaign and was told that the best route for any recompense would be through going through the complaint system of the independent case examiner. In both Wigan and Lee, we as local groups encourage women to put their cases forward to the DWP. Due to the volume of cases, the PHSO took over and decided to look carefully at six cases as being representative samples. These were then referred to the Public Health Ombudsman for a decision to be made. <coughs> Unfortunately, we've been waiting far too long, four years for that decision. Finally, the Ombudsman agreed that there had not been adequate personal communication of the changes in pension age. 
However, the sting in the tail was that although this was acknowledged, the finding was that we did not suffer enough for any compensation. In a matter of a few days in February this year, after further legal advice, the decision was made to contest this decision by a judicial review. But where would the funding for this come from? In fact, over £130,000 was raised in very small amounts over a matter of days. Waspy women dug deep. We had come so far and we were determined not to falter at this point. The situation, and you may have seen this in the press and on the television, changed dramatically last week. When the Ombudsman recognised, after being summoned to court for the judicial review, that part of the Stage 2 report is legally flawed and must be reconsidered. The PHSO has also recognised that the draft Stage 3 report is based on the Stage 2 report and therefore it be necessary for that draft report to remain unpublished and to be reconsidered in the light of whatever changes are made to the Stage 2 report. Since that report has not been completed, there is no need now for a quashing order in respect of it. The Ombudsman has also agreed to provide his provisional review, sorry, his provisional views on the changes to the Stage 2 and Draft Stage 3 reports to the interested parties along with the evidence on which they are based and allow them an opportunity to comment before reaching a further decision. As Angela Madden, Chair of WASPI, has recently stated, this is a real milestone on our very long journey to justice. We now call on all political parties to commit to fast and fair compensation for WASPI women. There is not a second to waste in recognizing the financial loss, hardship, and trauma DWP's incompetence has caused. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Wales. Do any other members wish to speak on the motion? Councillor David Molyneux. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And can I just say to both the speakers previously to me, absolutely fantastic and well addressed and well presented. And can I say on behalf of all the council, we ain't backing away from this in terms of our support for WASPI. And I can assure you tonight, Madam Mayor, should this motion be carried, which I damn well hope so it does, can I just say that we, I will take pleasure in writing to the Prime Minister. I will curb my language, Pat, I promise you. But what I will pledge is the support of this council and this borough in the fight for fair justice for the WASPI women. This is something that we will commit to and certainly something that we'll see through to the end in supporting our women in this fight. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councillor Draper, I now invite you to sum up. Well, just for a couple of minutes. I did get quite a bit nervous then, it's not usually like me. But at the end of the day, it means a lot to me. And what uh, Councillor Munner actually just said, the leader, is absolutely brilliant. We have these ladies up there in the gallery who's been working night and day. Let's be honest, it, it does upset your life. It takes your life away as well. They are voluntary. They are not paid for anything. They do it and they look after everybody and they're still here, sat there, fighting. And I'll be fighting with them. Thank you. Can I put the motion to the vote? All those in favour of the motion, please show. Any against? Any abstentions? The motion is carried, thank you. A motion has been submitted by the leader, which is set out on page 65 of the agenda. 
Leader. Thank you, thank you, Madam Mayor. I think the motion says it all, really. And if we just cast our minds back a couple of years ago, we actually had this conversation in terms of we as a council, in terms of DBS checks. And I think it's more and more important now in public life that people actually know who we are, what we are, and what we've done in a lot of respects. And I think we all fully understand the role that we play as councillors. Uh, we get involved with schools, we get involved with community groups, in churches, and we've certainly at Christmas we get involved with a lot of things within our communities. And I think it's only right and fitting that when we ask for volunteers, and volunteers who do school governors and various other uh, activities from guides to, to scouts, we all ask them to do a DBS check. And yet, there's no rule where a councillor should have to have a DBS check. And let us also not forget that we're corporate parents. We, we have a responsibility for young people of this borough who are in our care. And we make decisions, both in committees and in this council chamber, in terms of how these young people are treated. Now, I know the last time we debated, there was some opposition to actually making it compulsory. And we asked for a volunteer kind of setup where you volunteered to have a DBS check. But not everybody agreed to that. And that's one thing I could not understand. But now what we're asking for, Madam Mayor, is that we write to the government and insist that all elected representatives, both locally and regionally, have a full DBS check. I think it's the right thing for us to do. It may be something that our parliamentarians want to think about as well when we see some of the antics that parliamentarians get up to. But I think we should have the full political support across this chamber in for us to write to the, uh, to the, to the government asking them to implement that for councillors across this country. And what I will say to you, Madam Mayor, is every member of the Labour group, when they return to this council chamber for the annual general meeting of this council, will have a DBS check. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Deputy Leader, do you wish to speak on the motion or reserve your right to speak until later in the debate? Sorry, do you wish to second the motion thank you do any members wish to speak on the motion sorry councillor james watson uh, thank you madam mayor now there are already many barriers in place about becoming a local councillor and these include subject to a bankruptcy order or being convicted of an offense resulting in a prison sentence for more than um, three years and these barriers are changing frequently Recent changes under Local Government Act 2022 mean a ban on standing or, if once elected, being forced to step down if a councillor, for example, is added to the sex offenders register, and rightly so, because we have to protect our most vulnerable residents, and we have to protect the integrity of this chamber also. Now, I'm fully, I'm in fully support of this motion, and as I always support good motions, regardless of the political divide. And I cannot believe that this isn't standard practice already throughout national local government uh, uh, to begin with. However, the only issue that I've got with this motion is who is going to fund the, the DBS checks and when exactly is this going to happen? Now, for example, prior to election, will every candidate be required to pay for their own DBS prior to an election as these check, checks can be costly and very timely to get, uh, get delivered. And if the council is going to pay for these uh, DBS checks, will it be once the candidate is already elected? Then, if any barriers are found once elected, what would the necessary action be? Would this be a by-election and that would, would that be costly to the taxpayer in the process? And finally, how frequently will this DBS check be updated for long-standing councillors? So therefore, although I'm very supportive of this motion, and I do think it should be a prerequisite for all 
public servants and people who represent their communities. I'd like to know more about the particulars surrounding this motion that would provide a better and additional confidence for all elected representatives. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Deputy Leader, as you've reserved your right to speak, do you wish to speak on the motion? Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. <coughs> I mean, clearly, this is not a party political motion. You know, our party is as guilty as all the other parties in having some people who would not be determined as fit and proper persons. So there's no political element in this. But I think it's really important. We are public servants in the role that we fulfill as an elected member. And therefore, we're told many times that our employers are the public. And I think the public have a right to know whether a person is a fit and proper person, whether there is a DBS check. And uh, to be quite honest, in writing to the government, it would be the government to come up with a, uh, a system uh, and a financing thing. But to be quite honest, I don't think money is the issue. The issue is the protection of vulnerable people and the confidence that people can have. I mean, personally, I would make it that all candidates should have a published DBS check so that people know who they're voting for before they vote. And actually, it's like the leader said, I think this motion doesn't go far enough because I think every member of parliament or every person standing to be a member of parliament should have a DBS check. And I think the normal practice is to renew it every uh, three to four years, four years. I mean, in my job as, as a nurse, I, I was subject to a, an enhanced DBS check for all, my, all the time I was there. So I have no problem in having a DBS check. And I just think it's a concern for me that several years ago when we tried to make it compulsory and obviously we can't and we asked that every member of this council do it voluntarily uh, I'm a little disturbed that some people do not feel that they would volunteer for a DBS check because then the question is why so I absolutely support this motion I'd even take it further to include parliamentarians and candidates Personally, I would like to see those published so that the public, when they're voting, know the person they're voting for. It doesn't mean if somebody's got an offence or whatever that they can't be a candidate. But if people are aware, they can take that into consideration. It's like when you go for a job. Your DBS check does not need to be clear, but the employer needs to understand what happened and they can make a decision. So people with issues on DBS can be employed but it will be up to the public we up to the public to make their decision when they're voting and so I I do support this but personally I've gone much further than this thank you and the money is not an element leader would you like to sum up please thank you thank you madam I think as the deputy leader said, it's so important that it's unreal. And, and I think Councillor Watson was kind of quite shocked to find out that it wasn't a requirement. It definitely should be, and that's why we need to go to the government. But what I will say to you as an independent group, this group will all have DBS checks. Simple as. And it should be a prerequisite for every member of this chamber. But unfortunately, some years ago when we debated it in this chamber, there's a number of people who are still councillors spoke against it. And I think it's totally wrong. So I'm saying, and we'll get it out there, that each and every member of this council should have a DBS check. And that is why we will write to the government requesting that this is implemented throughout the UK. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Can I put the motion to the vote? All those in favour of the motion, please show. 
Any against? Any abstentions? Thank you, the motion is carried. A motion has been submitted by Councillor Bullen, which is set out on page 66 of the agenda. Councillor Bullen. Thank you, Madam Mayor, for allowing me to speak on this motion. Wigan is ranked the 67th most deprived local authority out of the 354 local authority districts in England. 29 of Wigan's 200 neighbourhoods fall within the 10% most deprived neighbourhoods in England. In one of our most deprived areas, 42% of children are eligible for free school meals. This motion demands that free school meals should be available for all primary school children from reception class through to year six. The current arrangement is that there's a universal entitlement just for key stage one, which is reception year one and year two children. The Child Poverty Action Group, a charity which collects and analyzes data about how welfare changes are affecting the well-being of children, their families and their communities, tells us that there were 4.2 million children living in poverty in the UK in 2021 to 22. That is 29% of children, or looking at it another way, nine children in a class of 30. These figures are steadily increasing as the cost of living crisis worsens, and we know that this is causing even greater hardship. The household earnings threshold for free school meals is very low at £7,400. This has been in place since 2018, while food and drink inflation has risen by 13.1% in just one year. The government must not just stand and watch. A time for change is needed. Means testing means that not all low-income families are eligible. Divisions in means-tested system creates a stigma and a barrier, even for parents and carers who are aware of the system and their entitlement. In Wigan, I'm pleased to say, we use the household support from, from government wisely. And our officer team in customer experience and support are to be thanked and praised for the speedy and efficient way in which they've provided support for those in need. <coughs> Nearly 50% of this fund is allocated to families that are eligible for means-tested free school meals. The number who are eligible for free school meals, Madam Mayor, is now over 13,000 a number that has gone up rapidly during and since the pandemic. But for me, the strongest argument is the very basic fact that children cannot learn well without sustenance. We know that many children go to school without breakfast. We also know that many families struggle to provide a decent meal every day because of the rising costs of basic foodstuffs and also energy and fuel price rises. So children are going hungry. This seriously affects their ability to concentrate and reach their full potential. There's no doubt that an empty stomach compromises a child's ability to learn. It's a proven fact that children need warm, nutritious meals for their health, well-being and development. Finally, Madam Mayor, I had hoped that I might be asking for this motion to be withdrawn because, in fact, there is a bill on its way through Parliament proposing free school meals for all children. However, yet again, the reading of this bill has been blocked. And despite some support from senior Tories, as the majority have no appetite for it, sorry for the pun, it is highly unlikely to be carried. That's why I'm asking for your support in writing to the Prime Minister to ask him to introduce, as a matter of urgency, free school meals for all primary children. Our children in the borough need this for the best start of life, 
their health, well-being and happiness and the ability to succeed. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Is the motion seconded? Councillor Flynn, do you wish to speak on the motion or reserve your right to speak later? I'll speak now, please. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor, for allowing me to speak. Since free school meals were introduced in 2014 for primary school children in reception to year two, we have seen many positive benefits, including increased school attendance, reduced child obesity and improved academic attainment. Making the entitlement universal for these ages took away any stigma and meant that all those children who needed this support were able to access it without question. If this motion is carried by our council this evening, we will be joining a long list of significant supporters who are all expressing concern to the Prime Minister that children are going hungry and their capacity to learn and to succeed is being diminished. The Feed the Future Coalition, which includes Jamie Oliver and other notable chefs, are all in support, as are major healthcare organisations, trade unions and many charities, representing doctors, nurses, midwives and dietitians. And even some senior Tories are in support, including every teacher's favourite, Michael Goh. He wants to see universal free school meals for all family, for all families on universal credits implemented immediately with an extension to all primary school children next year. There is evidence from a report by PricewaterhouseCooper, which was commissioned by the Impact for Urban Health, that shows there are decisive cost benefits to having universal free school meals in primary school. The cost benefit is estimated at 41.3 billion if universal free school meals were provided. Savings would compromise of 22.5 billion in reduced food costs to families, 18.5 billion in lifetime earnings and contributions, and 0.3 billion in cost savings to schools. There would also be an additional 12 million in cost savings related to obesity. For every one pound invested in free school meals, the benefit cost ratio is 1.71. And you don't need to have studied maths to 18 to know that that makes financial sense. But the impact is priceless. Provision of school meals is currently a postcode lottery. Scotland and Wales are already rolling them out in all primary schools. And the Mayor of London very recently announced that an emergency 12 months of universal free school meals will be provided for all the capital's primary schools from September. Our young people in Wigan deserve the same support and opportunities as children in Wales, Scotland and London. But Madam Mayor, I would like to draw your attention to a particular ask of this motion, that universal free school meals be introduced as a matter of urgency. Children only get one shot at education. A child in Wigan sitting their GCSEs and leaving secondary school this year has spent their entire statutory school experience in an underfunded and undervalued education system thanks to the choices of this current government. We need urgent change. Urgent reform of the SEND system, urgent reform of Ofsted and an urgent fully funded and restorative pay rise for our hard-working education staff. We urgently need a Labour government. But an immediate and incredibly impactful change that this government could make is to expand universal free school meals to year six from September. All councillors in this chamber, regardless of our political affiliation, know our local residents and know that they in this borough have suffered more than most during the cost of living crisis. They know that this council itself has suffered more than others at the hands of the Conservative cuts to local government in the name of austerity. And I know that all councillors in this chamber will do absolutely everything they can to improve the lives and life chances of their residents. So please, support this motion. It makes economic and financial sense, but fundamentally, it is the right thing to do and could transform the lives and educational opportunities of young people in this borough and beyond. 
Madam Mayor, I'm proud to second this motion. Do any members wish to speak on the motion? Sorry, sorry Councillor Sharrett. Councillor James Watson. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you for your passion there in speaking. Now, I'm fully, I'm fully supportive here of free school meals for those in need, but I don't think that all children at primary school require universal um, free school meals, but rather how we means test. This has to be changed, and the bar needs to be raised to include those low-earning families. Now, if it was the motion was for rather means testing, this would also include those, uh, those, those children who attend secondary school as well. Now, by including all children in this motion to national government, I fear that this will be refused by the current government due to the vast costs involved. Whereas if the motion was to ra raise the means testing level, then I think it, had a, it will have a better chance of, uh, of, of uh, being successful. However, you know, I cannot wait for the next general election where a Labour government may well be in power. And I do look forward to seeing a Labour government, you know, passing out universal free meals for all children and supporting this motion. And, you know, like I say, it's a sound motion. I think all children deserve a meal and I will be supporting this motion. Yet again, thank you very much for your passion there. Uh, well done in the motion. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Janet, Sh Janet Sh Thank you, Madam Mayor, for allowing me to speak. Um, fully behind you, Councillor Flynn, on this. Totally disagree with what you said, Councillor Watson, by the way. Um, I worked in the school meal service. I actually worked um, in a CV school. And um, I did about 10 years in all. I was forced to look for another job because Margaret Thatcher, in her infinite wisdom, decided to cut the subsidies on school meal services. And actually, we went from making between 900 and 1,000 dinners a day because we actually supplied the local high school and several nurseries. Um, we actually went from that to about half the number of meals. Um, there's enough wealth in this country. No kid should be going hungry. No child. Neither in this borough or nationwide. So I fully support this motion. Thank you. Councillor Stuart Gerrard. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <coughs> I uh, fully support the motion too. Uh, as a parent, bringing up three children just above the uh, universal credit uh, line, which I thought was totally unfair. Uh, school meals, bus fares, everything to get your kids to school to education was expensive, and it still is. I opted to go down the bus driver to get the free, bu free bus pass. Uh, Free bus passes, basically, for my children. <laughs> I've just carried on doing it. But, yeah, in a previous job, I visited near enough, I'd say 90% of the schools, secondary schools, in, in England, Wales, and Scotland, through a, a project called AMI. I don't know if people remember it. Uh, it was in this borough quite a, a lot. And the difference between children who were nourished properly to those who were living off Smarties or, or whatever, I, I, I sleep food was plain to see to everybody. Those properly nourished were learning properly, were well behaved. Those who were missing out weren't, basically, and, and that's that's the crux of it. But yeah, I fully support this, and I agree partly with what uh, my colleague says about raising the uh, the universal, you know, the, the threshold of who will qualify for it. Because as Councillor Conway for always uh, compares us to Surrey, I don't think there's many people in Surrey, families in Surrey who would be in need of uh, the, the universal free school meals. I think more could be spent on this side and bring more people into 
uh, the free school meals. And also, if you remember last year, we had a surplus of a million pound in this borough. And uh, as Councillor Flynn alluded to, the Mayor of London, for 12 months, has uh, provided free school meals from September for 12 months. Now, seeing as my uh, amendment didn't go through, one of the reasons why we couldn't vote for the budget, perhaps that £1 million surplus, we could follow London's uh, uh, <coughs> example and use that £1 million surplus from September and feed our primary school children properly and be a flag bearer for it. So I don't know what, what people would think of that, but yeah, fully supportive of it. Thank you. Councillor Dane Anderton. So, thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I just kind of want to come back to what Councillor Watson said about means testing. When it comes to DBS, you said it was a barrier. Let's just get rid of barriers and feed children universally across the country. Let's not discriminate against Surrey, against uh, Wigan, against Lee or wherever. Let's give free access universally to, to school meals so then we can get that cost-benefit analysis because it benefits us all in the future at the end of the day. That's my first point. Second one is there seems to be a bit of a theme kind of coming out tonight. We've had an excellent uh, motion from Councillor Draper and Councillor Wales as well on, on WASPI. We've got the motion from Councillor Bunn and Councillor Flynn on free school meals. You know, this government totes out levelling up. The Conservatives are the only thing holding the country back at the moment. It is only Labour who can build a better Britain, okay? It is us here on this chamber who are making sure we put our residents, our children, our 1950s women, and our elderly at the centre of what we do. That's why we passed a budget through Councillor Cunliffe, which puts adult social care at the heart of this, putting the needs of our residents at the heart of what we do, okay? So I just want to say, sorry. I'm on the question. I'm talking about free school meals and this policy about levelling up that you, that the Conservatives have and the fact that this is, if they want to get serious, let's level up on pensions, let's level up on free school meals and do it now. I'm taking it. Councillor Anderson, can you stick to the motion, please? Yeah, so your colleague Thank raised you. the point about barriers. I'm just saying let's get rid of the barriers. Let's get rid of the barriers from free, um, bringing in free school meals. As a, as a um, governor as well in a, one of these deprived areas, Wesley, two schools, I see this day in, day out, and you've got my full support for this, and it can't come soon enough. All we've got is blockades and blockades in front of this. We need it now. It's more than ever in Lee, in Wigan, and in Makefield as well. So thank you, Madam Mayor. Councillor Keith Cunliffe. Thank you, Madam Mayor. In fully supporting this motion, um, can I just say that Sir Michael Marmot laid down 12 years ago the wider determinants of health and how people's health is affected. One of the issues was to give all children the best start in life. The first thousand days of a child's life are hugely important in their life progress throughout their life in terms of health and well-being. And, you know, this idea of means testing or raising the bar is ridiculous. It's in all our benefit to ensure the health and well-being of our children growing up into being adults. Because what happens in childhood impacts on adult life and health. And maybe people are wealthier in Surrey, but that doesn't mean the children are getting fed properly. The, and the other thing is, means tested brings about some status doesn't it mm. some children are getting free school meals some children aren't there's things about stigmatizing people and making people feel inferior so actually universal free school meals for all primary school children is a great way to improve the health and well-being of those children but also through into their adulthood to prevent stigmatisation and to ensure that our children are getting a meal. And the cost really is irrelevant because it will save over a period of time by having healthier children and healthier adults. And that's how it will be paid for. 
So universal free school meals is the only way forward to ensure we have a happy, healthy population in future. And I fully support this. Councillor Bullen, would you like to sum up? Thank you, Madam Mayor, and I'd like to thank um, members for their comments. Very welcome indeed. Although I did find it quite contradictory because over here, when we're talking about we need to have means-tested uh, free school meals, and on the other hand, suggesting that we do as the uh, Mayor of London has done and, and, and do it just for Wigan. But it's as colleagues have said, we do not want these uh, discrepancies. We want this for the benefit of all children and the cost of living crisis is affecting everyone. We do know this. So let's not create those uh, disparities because wherever you have means testing, you've always got that threshold, haven't you? Which is very, very low at the moment. But if you put it somewhere else, it's still a threshold. It's still a barrier. It's still an inequality. So I think the benefits of free school meals for primary school children, as described, far, the benefits far outweigh the costs. And I think we've, we've picked up the benefits. I've talked about the benefits clearly being shown for children and their life chances. Councillor Flynn has shown us the cost benefits for the whole economy and health of the country. So what have we got here, really? We've got a government that spends billions on a pensions tax giveaway for the top 1%. This government, a Tory government for the few. A government that's dilly-dallying on legislation which could provide decent life chances for all our children. These are our children, the children of the borough, their future and our future. Support the motion. Can I put the motion to the vote? All those in favour of the motion, please show. Any against? Any abstentions? The motion is carried. Thank you. Before we move to the next motion, can I just advise the Chamber that there is less than an hour to conclude business this evening? Item four on the motions. A motion has been submitted by Councillor Anderton, which is set out on page 66 of the agenda. Councillor Anderton. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor, for allowing me to speak on this. Um, it's all about public transport and more so the Metrolink. So I'll just outline my case first of all. So public transport in the north is very important to us, and especially in Lee for a variety of reasons. So firstly, it provides um, an affordable and reliable way for people to get around to access opportunities such as education, employment, health care, and so on. Not everyone can afford a car, not everyone can um, also be allowed to drive the car due to maybe age or disability or whatever reason that might be. But at the end of the day, we all need to get somewhere to access services, uh, whether that be health, education and employment. Secondly, public transport also helps reduce traffic congestion, a topic that we're all very familiar with in, in our particular wards and around the borough. So especially in, in northern towns, our streets and roads weren't designed um, for uh, the types of traffic that we might have now. So good public transport that works effectively and efficiently is not just environmentally, but also in the public health interest as well. So it's important in towns where the road infrastructure needs to accommodate um, large volumes of traffic. And if we can make journeys easier, multimodal and different, then it will also help reduce congestion. But also, public transport can also help the local economy. It can bring people to places. It can help them spend their money in those places as well. It can be a job creator. It can also make it easier for people to travel to and from places um, via that public transport, which boosts trades, creates jobs. So public transport, it's, it, it's essential component of any kind of urban life and northern life that we are familiar with today. And it plays a really important role for people to access services and opportunities. So we turn that now to the Wigan Borough. We know that Wigan is going to be the first to roll out the bus reforms um, that the Labour Mayor has kind of fought for and, and won successfully in court. 
But we also know after successive uh, Labour councils have fought for the guided busway as well within uh, Lee, which has been a very welcomed um, investment whilst labelled a, a white elephant back in its day. It's actually paved itself time and, and time again now. And it's given many people access to employability, uh, sorry, employment and uh, access to services as well. If we look at rail, we've got several rail stations around the borough. We've got Wigan North Western here in the town centre, Wigan Walgate, Inn, Tindley and Bryn. But also if we look at Lee, we don't have a railway station, had one, but it went. But if you look at the nearest stations, we've got Hag Falls, we've got Atherton, we've got Newtley Willows, which is St. Helens, and we've got Daisy Hill, which is in Bolton. Many of these are kind of servicing the Manchester and Southport lines and also the Liverpool line. But I think as well I need to put on note, thanks to Councillor Cleave, Councillor Gambles and Councillor Merritt, that your fight uh, for uh, the reopening of Goldburn Station with an ex-MP for Leeds Road Class as well. I think that makes sense that, that you've lobbied very well with the Mayor of Greater Manchester and Transport for Trade for uh, Greater Manchester to have the, possibly the first one in 25 years to be reopened in the borough as well, which again addressing the deficit that we have in that part of the, of the borough to provide again that opportunity, that access to uh, employment for the wider Lee constituency. But also I just want to kind of say as well, that having spoke to Councillor John Vickers, he's lobbied uh, at Transport for Trade Manchester over the last 12 months, emphasising and re-emphasising with uh, time and time again the lack of connectivity in the borough, and in particular on that east part of the borough as well. And this is why we need to consider the metro link coming into Lee. We've acknowledged as well that Lee does have its limitations when it comes to uh, its transport links and be they geographical, historical, uh, but I think the biggest being um, public policy around transport. So Lee being on the outskirts of Greater Manchester, it's relatively kind of isolated from the, the main city centre, the city region, um, which kind of most of the metro link comes out of, out of Manchester. Uh, so people mainly will rely on the car, they'll rely on the guided busway. Uh, the guided busway isn't without its faults, we know that, it's, obvers it's oversubscribed at the moment at, at peak times. But it's a very welcomed investment, which helps connect us in some way. But we need to diversify that transport offer. Secondly, we acknowledge as well the historical links, the coal mining and industrial town of Lee, um, the streets, buildings, they were constructed with a futuristic kind of public transport service in mind. But things are changing. And the topography, the geography of Lee is changing. So making sure that we can have uh, the Metrolink come straight into Lee as well. We think now is the time to do this. The, the, the um, possibilities are there. But mostly, we're seeing small but good changes to transport policy nationally. And that's been kind of evidenced now through the guided bus, uh, sorry, not guided busway, through the bus reforms that have been uh, pushed through um, by the Greater Manchester Mayor as well. So this has allowed uh, a bit more involvement from various stakeholders, but it's led to a reduction uh, as well. Uh, sorry, previous transport policy has led to a reduction in frequency and coverage of bus services. So again, going towards more profitable routes and kind of pushing on an open door, hopefully, with this so you actually know what it's about. But overall, public transport in Lee, um, it's a, set of a, a, a complex set of results and factors such as history, geography and public transport policy. But now we're at the right time to address this and have a coordinated effort between local authority, between transport authorities and other stakeholders around the borough as well and in Lee to ensure that people of Lee have access to those opportunities that they need. So this is the moment that we are seeking and asking for that coordinated effort to bring the Metro link into this borough. The Greater Manchester's Transport Strategy 2040 only really mentions Lee twice and commends uh, the work that's been done on the guided busway, but they want, to support, they want to support sustainable economic growth, protect the environment, improve local quality of life and develop an innovative city region. This is happening. It's gone to Trafford, it's gone to Trafford Park, it's gone to Manchester Airport, it's gone to the Second City Crossing, it's proposed to go to Stockport, Middleton. What's all this saying? It's going north, it's going south, it's going east. It's not coming west. Why is it not coming west? And this is what we're asking for tonight. It needs to come west towards Lee, towards Lee constituency, through uh, possibly Atherton, Tilsley, all the other surrounding wards <laughs> around Lee as well. So it's the right choice for Lee. It's clean, it's resilient transport methods. We had the trolley buses back in the day. We need the trams back here in Lee as well, providing that diversity of transport, enabling people to use multiple modes of transport, the car, the bus, uh, the tram, whichever is the best choice for you to make an easy journey. So overall, improving transport in Lee will require a coordinated effort between this local authority and various stakeholder groups as well. And we want to knock on GMCA's door and get this as a priority. So as the motion says, we ask that this council request GMCA 
and transport for Greater Manchester to bring forward an option and a business case for the inclusion of the town of Lee as a Metrolink terminus. The aim being to diversify transport options in and out of Lee to improve connectivity with Lee and other centres across Greater Manchester. Is the motion seconded? Uh, Madam Mayor, and reserve my right to speak. Do any members wish to speak on the motion? Councillor John Harding. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I fully support this. I mean, who wouldn't? So you're absolutely uh, right, my councillor colleagues. Absolutely. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm taller than when I'm standing up. Um, I fully support this. It's uh, it, it's a, you know a good motion put together, um, and I hope to see it come along sooner rather than later. What I would say is, and the reason I'm I'm standing up and mentioning uh, that I'd like to see it coming rather than later is, of course. We do have the guided busway in Lee, and as, as other Lee councillors, we have one foot in Lee and one foot in Atherton, which is a little bit unusual, and I mentioned that before. But one of the issues that we have seen is um, that the V2, at the minute, isn't doing what it used to do. So we're actually, at, we've got a, a worse system than we had originally. Um, Andy Burnham did a, a question time event at Lee Sports Village uh, that some, some of the colleagues will recall. Myself and Deborah were at that, uh, at that meeting uh, and there were questions asked about the guided busway, for example, which of course would lend itself well to, to being converted to a, a Metrolink system. As a result of that, we asked for a meeting with TFGM and we held that meeting at Atherton Town Hall with, with colleagues from across the, across the way as well as, as myself and, and Councillor Wales. I asked the question, what is the vision for the guided busway? You know, is it an express system of getting people from Lee and Atherton into the city and back again? Or is it just another bus service? Because one of the problems is that the V1 and the V2, when they get beyond the guided busway and when they get beyond the East Lanks Road, they're snarled up in Salford Crescent, people getting on and getting off, and it's just another bus service. So one question is, can you revisit what the vision is, TFGM, and tell us what the guided busway is for? And they did agree with that, to be fair. But, you know, the, the other point is that because, certainly since COVID, they took off the, the actual V2 going straight through from Atherton, going straight through to Manchester. So outside of peak times, you've got to queue up at uh, Atherton, potentially in the cold in winter. You've then to get off the bus at the interchange in, in Tilsley, Stroke, Astley, and wait for the bus coming, the V1 coming from Lee, so that you can actually continue your journey. And that wasn't acceptable to any of us that were at that meeting. And we asked that, um, that our colleagues from TFGM would go and speak to the mayor, speak to Andy Burnham, with a view to subsidising um, the V2 to put it back on, because the evidence they were showing was, well, there isn't the footfall. Well, of course there isn't the footfall, because the, the bus doesn't go all the way. So we're saying, you, you're not comparing apples with apples, you're comparing apples with oranges. So put it back as it was, so that the V2 runs off peak, and that way we can then make a proper comparison. So just to keep back on to the, the reason I mentioned that is because since that meeting, despite numerous phone calls, despite numerous emails, absolutely nothing's happened. So if we're going to wait that length of time to get the V2 reinstated, I very much hope that we won't be waiting an equally long time to get this particular uh, tram system, the Metrolink, to Lee off the ground. Fully support it, it's fantastic. And I just hope that TFGM will do the first bit first and then be rapid in getting the Metrolink sorted. Thank you very much. Councillor Stuart Gerrard. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh, thank you, Councillor Anderton, for fetching this motion. I think we brought similar kind of motions in the past. Uh, so I'm glad you've uh, finally come around to this way of thinking of improving our public transport on this side of the borough. Uh, 
as Councillor Harding said there about the, the Gardy Buzzway, we've had many meetings and many correspondences with, with TFGM, and TFGM are probably the hardest organisation to deal with. So good luck with this, really. I mean, this is this is what is needed in, in Lee. Uh, on the Gardy Buzzway, though, I have been assured of TFGM that come when franchising kicks in on the September 23rd, that there will be a full service again on the V2, uh, which I hope they, they keep by the word. Uh, but with the, the Metrolink coming to this side of the borough, as you, as you mentioned, there was plans in 2018 from uh, Andy Burnham stating that they'd like to see the Metrolink coming down in towards Atherton, this, this side of the borough, by, well, it would have been 20. 2021, 22 at that time, and obviously still nothing. It's no nearer now than it, it was then. Uh, but the infrastructure is there to get the Metrolink quickly down the lines, down down to Atherton, and then maybe you, you have to cut on that way and have, a, have a, a service going to the station there. Because in Lee, it's going to be very difficult without removing the guarded busway. And then you've got the conundrum then of not having a direct bus service to, uh, to Manchester from Lee. So th there's all these to take on board. Because in Atherton, for the V2, what we had, the V2 replaced four direct services to Manchester. Now we've got none. And Lee, if that, that happens to Lee, you could be in all, all kinds of trouble, really, with the, with the network. Because they're not just getting off in Manchester, they're getting off in between. Uh, so that's all the things to look for. But... We need, we need the, the original plan that Andy Burnham came up with about the, uh, the metro coming down the, the lines towards Atherton, which is the quicker fix for the, this side of the borough, and have a shuttle service to the station or something like that. That might be the quick fix until... The, because these things take years. The, the building of the metro link took years, didn't it, really? It, you know, the best part of a decade uh, to get the lines in. And from Lee to Manchester, that's a lot... It's going to take a while, so we, we have to look at the quick fixes first before they, they get the normal lines in. But yeah, I'm fully in support of it. Thank you. Councillor Keith Cunliffe. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor. I mean, I think there is no quick fix to this. If I can remember going back to the guided busway and the length of time that took, I mean, it's been a tremendous success. I mean, the founder of the Atherton Independence called it a white elephant and was on the Transport Authority in objecting to it. But it came, <laughs> it came, and it did. And so talking about um, alterations with the V1 and V2, I think what we need to be doing is recognising that this is a long-term option, will take some time, and come up, and demand from the GMCA and TFGM a really ambitious project to modernise <coughs> Metrolink rail transport into the west of the borough to those and, and Lee particularly because you know there are rail there are rail stations in Atherton, uh, but certainly to Lee and possibly Goulburn as well. Goulburn's getting the station. What? options are available because I think that starts to build up then a bigger case for a fundamental regeneration of the Lee area linked with modern transport uh, options across the whole of the, the borough. So, so that west side and probably Bolton needs to be included as well <laughs> in a way. So actually what we want is a real option for modernising the system that is going to be the transport system that we're going to have in the west of uh, the conurbation, but you know you're talking long term. Uh, I mean, I, I would think you'd be talking 20 years, but you want to get it when you start demanding it. So we need to start demanding it in order to get it in future now. Councillor Anderson, you've reserved your right to speak. Right, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, obviously, there's been <coughs> quite a lot of discussion on the motion, uh, a lot of valid points made. 
uh, especially by Councillor Litton and Councillor Harding. Um, unfortunately, as uh, Councillor Cunliffe uh, highlights, it's, it's probably going to be a medium term um, potential list. But what, what we do need is a holistic approach with all stakeholders focused on it, that, that regeneration in, in Lee, which we've you know, which we desperately need. Um, improved public transport is good for the environment, the local economy, congestion, and social connectivity. I want to make a, a personal appeal to the Mayor of Greater Manchester tonight to help make sure that transport for Greater Manchester and the Greater Manchester Combined Authority bureaucracy works well for the residents of Lee. Just a reminder that, obviously, it was residents of Lee who helped um, Andy on his political career back in 2001. As important areas on the edge of Greater Manchester have the first share of transport infrastructure investment. And we've been very patient in waiting for Metrolink, uh, 25 years up to now, and I'm hoping it's going to be a much shorter length of wait for the future. Thank you. Councillor Anderton, would you like to sum up? Just, just, just very briefly, and, and thank you for all, all the contributions. Um, to this motion. I think uh, Councillor Cunliffe summed it up pretty well as well. It is a long term. We're putting the line in the sand. We're putting our foot down, making it policy tonight that this is what we want. As I said, the Greater Manchester Transport Strategy 2040, it mentions Lee twice. It mentions the borough in other, ele in other elements, but it doesn't really put anything solid down. And the tram coming down to Allerton, I think they're yet to test it uh, as well. I think we're still far away from that. So yeah, this is about, put, let's put our foot down, let's put our line in the sand, let's get it tested on the rails down to Aberton, let's get it then into Lee as well. So thank you everyone for your support and I hope you vote it through. Can I put the motion to the vote? All those in favour, please show. Anyone against? Any abstentions? The motion is being carried, thank you. Can I just remind members that uh, we now have less than half an hour um, to conclude business. A motion has been submitted by Councillor Gerard, which is set out on page 67 of the agenda. Councillor Gerard. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, the motion is basically, given that Wiganborough has experienced a recent spike in the number of council homes, left empty for six months or more, that council officers produce a report for consideration by the council to examine the potential options available to the council to further reduce the number of empty homes in the borough. Uh, I'd like to expand on that if I can. Uh, we've had a clean sweep of motions being voted for tonight. I'm not holding any hopes up, but uh, <laughs> here we go. In for a penny. Right. I have brought this to discuss a pressing issue that affects many communities, empty council houses and flats. These are publicly owned homes that are currently unoccupied and often in need of repair or, or refurbishment. Empty council houses are a problem for several reasons. First, they represent a missed opportunity to provide a much needed affordable housing for people who are struggling to find a place to live. Many families and people are currently living in overcrowded or unsuitable conditions, and these empty houses could make a real difference in their lives. Secondly, empty council houses can attract vandalism and other forms of criminal activity. They can also be a source of blight on our neighbourhoods, dragging down property values and making it harder for other residents to sell their homes or find renters. Moreover, empty council houses represent a waste of public resources. Our communities invest in these properties and it is our responsibility to ensure that they are being used to their fullest potential. So what can we do about this issue? One solution is to invest more resources in refurbishing and repairing these properties so that they are ready for occupancy in a timely manner. This could involve working with local contractors, community groups and volunteers to carry repairs and renovations. We must also address the root cause of why these properties are empty in the first place and for so long. This could involve looking at issues such as the allocation process, legal and regulatory barriers, and the impact of austerity measures on local authorities. In conclusion, empty council houses are a real problem that affects our communities, and in many ways. 
we need to take action to address this issue and ensure these valuable public resources are being used to their fullest potential. By investing in repairs and renovations, providing in incentives and addressing the underlying causes, we can help ensure that everyone has access to safe, affordable and suita uh, suitable housing. Thank you. Thank you. Is the motion seconded? Yeah, happy to second, Madam Mayor. Councillor Washington, do you wish to speak on the motion or reserve your right to speak? I'll speak now, thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Um, it's been well documented about 13,000 families on the uh, council house uh, waiting list. Now, if somebody's properties are vacant for long periods of time, that's a loss of uh, occupancy for our residents, and it's also a loss of um, rental income, which can then be used to purchase more housing stock and take the pressure off this waiting list. Now, this council has many priorities, but we should be adding social housing to this list, as publicly owned housing provide financial freedom for many of our financially vulnerable residents within the borough. Now, I'm fully supportive of Councillor Gerard here, because I think we all know, as councillors, our, our daily inbox of messages from our residents about the issues regarding the lack of available housing. So, I do look forward to everyone in this chamber supporting my colleague's uh, motion. Now, I want to finish here on this. Three of the five motions submitted this evening have been targeting national government. So I'm going to quote the leader in one of his very popular sayings, there must be an election coming. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Do any other members wish to speak on the motion? Councillor Susan Gambles. Are you, su are you surprised? <laughs> uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, for allowing me to speak. And thank you, councillors Gerard and Watson, for, uh, for your motion. And I hope you'll be both pleased and relieved when I say that I can't support the motion. <laughs> and these are my reasons why. Uh, which, right. Firstly, this area of work is already ongoing. And it falls under the responsibility of the Housing Advisory Panel, uh, who oversees the housing function. It reports into Cabinet. And it's also subject to scrutiny from the Housing Regulator. The members are an equal number of elected members and tenant representatives. They're all very clear in their expectations. They set very high standards as, as on quality and are very much outcome driven. And in addition to undertaking scrutiny reports, inspecting and questioning, they also work with and for our tenants. Now, there's been detailed and robust discussions have taken place about the voids in this area of work that are at the Housing Advisory Panel meetings. And I've also outlined some of, this in the, some of the stuff that's happening at full council on a number of occasions. For example, at the budget meeting, we were, we were confirming that we'd obtained nearly 2.2 million from Greater Manchester, but also matching from our housing revenue account, account of 2.1 million to retrofit and future-proof our homes and get the bills down. 50 of our voids are actually being used as the pilot. You may remember, I have mentioned it more than once, and that's some of the things that we're doing. Three of these have been completed already. We've got two in Lawton East, and we've also got one in Beach Hill. So we're actually not, use, we're not using it in any political way whatsoever, and we're, the, we're on with the, uh, the others. The, so the Housing Advisory Panel is a critical part of the housing scrutiny and the housing function. And Councillor Gerard, uh, um, you may recall that I reminded you at a previous council meeting that your group actually has a representative on that housing advisory panel. And it's something that you all seemed a little bit surprised at, uh, uh, which was strange, as it was Councillor Wilkinson that was placed on the panel as a result of a vote at our AGM, and it was between your group and the Conservative group, and your group won on this occasion and <coughs> got the seat. So, it, it, it's, it's, uh, so I can accept, to be honest, and the... We're not here today, but the, the, our Conservative colleagues could be a bit out of touch with what's happening in housing matters, not having representation. But I would have expected you as the leader of the group to have spoken to your representative on this panel before submitting this motion. As your representative will have had the papers, the minutes, they've been invited to all the meetings, they had de where they had detailed presentations, uh, there's been incisive and inquiring questionings, Promote, uh, pr pr promoting detailed conversations, challenging and, uh, pr challenges and providing solutions. 
and making an agreement on how we move forward. I can really well assure you that this area of work is making good progress. In your ward alone, 95 war voids were completed and handed over in 2023. A further 35 voids in your ward are progressing at the moment and we expect these to be handed over in mid-May. The longest void in your ward was actually ready in September 22. And this has been waiting for a gas mains connection. Uh, and as we've mentioned before, there's a shortage in our workforce, but there's also a shortage in the gas and the water. And quite often we're waiting for those to be carried out in order to get those properties occupied. Councillor Watson's kindly mentioned uh, in previous meetings that we've had many a conversation about housing, which we have. I'm always open and willing to have any discussion with anybody in this chamber about our plans, our progress, and, our, and what we're actually doing. I actually have a meeting in the diary with one of your colleagues, Councillor Breeley. So if you'd like to join us, I'll send you the date. <laughs> so, <laughs> go for an offer. So I, I hope you understand why I cannot support this motion due to the level of work that's already in progress. The plans that have been put into place are for a robust and effective approach into turning round any of our voids as quickly as possible. And there is already a scrutiny on the housing function, as there are already systems and processes in place and scrutiny on the decision-making process itself. The members of the housing, revenue, housing Advisory Panel and the supporting teams continue to work really hard improving the housing function in its service. They're extremely capable and committed and I hope that you will accept that things are in place. In view of what I've outlined, I would wonder if you would consider withdrawing your motion. It's up to you. But if not, uh, I'm actually obliged to go and to reject the motion. But thank you for bringing it to our attention. Councillor Keith Cunliffe. Thank you, Madam Mayor. If you meet him with Councillor Burley, he's after the 4th of May. It might be cancelled. <laughs> um, I don't know whether it's getting to be a sort of uh, a tactic or something, but we keep getting motions from Councillor Gerard asking us to do things that we're already doing. <coughs> so that seems to be sort of a regular feature. No doubt at the next council meeting, if he's here, we'll be hearing about this, uh, asking the council to ensure that it goes light before six o'clock in the morning or whatever. I don't know, night follows day, whatever. But I would ju just wanted to pick up on, on Councillor Watson's uh, comments. Council housing and social housing in this borough well, in every borough, it's provided through the housing revenue account, which is ring-fenced. So the income to the housing revenue account is rent, and the only spending can be made from the housing revenue account on our council housing. That's it. So the general fund can't pay for council housing, and the housing revenue fund can't pay for any general funding. Over the last few years, and for a period of four years, the Conservative government insisted that we reduce rent by 1% for four years continuously. The impact of that was a reduction on our income on the housing revenue account of £30 million. This year, the government upped the, well, they didn't up, the, they actually decreased because the the, uh, the government's uh, proposals for housing rents, council rents increase was inflation plus 1%. And of course, inflation was 10%. So plus 1% would be 11%. But they set the maximum that we could have increased the rents by 7%, which is below inflation. Cost of materials going up, difficulty in getting staff and wages, so you oppose the 7% rent increase, yet you sit there now and tell us we should be investing more in our council housing. Well, how can we, if we have a below inflation rent rise, a £30 million loss through having to give rent reductions for four years, 
And the only way we can invest is from the housing revenue account. So something a bit hypocritical about what you're coming out with and in terms of the way you're presenting that. In terms of what we are doing, yeah, there are 13,000 people on the housing waiting list. But one of the things we are doing from the housing revenue account is building more council housing. And I think we've built somewhere in the region about 400 houses in the last 12 months. This council is probably building more council houses than many other councils across the country. And we're doing it from the housing revenue account. But it's not helped when, one, we have to reduce rent, and then, when we can, we got below inflation rises, which you don't support, and then demand more investment. Absolute hypocrisy. Councillor Gerard, I now invite you to sum up on the motion. <coughs> sorry, sorry, Councillor Gerard. Councillor Fred Walker. Thank you. <coughs> Just very simple point, because I'm slightly confused, and maybe in the the answer will get well. That confusion might be a little dissipated. But a month ago at planning committee, we had a planning application put in by this council for some new property in Aberton. We were converting some empty property, some of this property that's that's not being used. Uh, <coughs> And we were going to convert it so that ho a homeless unit could be developed there. And we've got a fabulous success story. Um, these are not just straightforward homeless off the street. These are people that have been developed by social workers so that they're ready to be back in their own houses. So this was for the people of Averton moving on from that being homeless and struggling to coming back into having a property of their own in Atherton, and guess who opposed it? That gentleman on the end. And I'm a little bit confused by, by that. I never understood at the planning meeting why he was opposing it, and his colleague, who'd also vocally opposed it on social media, and that's where we'll be reading the version of today's events, because he controls the local Atherton social media. But, so I'm confused that he wants to occupy these empty properties and bring on properties for our people when he's turning down opportunities in Atherton for this to be done. Thank you. Councillor Gerard, would you like to sum up on the motion? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I'm sorry, Fred, you're a little bit confused. I'm glad to see you've woke up, though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very much. I'm asleep most of the meeting. Uh, right, Warwick, War War though, let's get on to that. Yeah, I, I oppose that because it's bringing homeless people in. Uh, not bringing homeless people, bringing people with addiction needs and stuff like that. But let's give you a bit of background on Warwick Road. There was a family on Kerr Bank Street. A, fa a family on Kerr Bank Street is overcrowded. They've got two tents in the front garden, and that house was turned down for them to be used. Yeah. Right? And it, it weren't for people of Addison that. It was for anybody who found themselves homeless on Warwick Road. It's not just for the people of Addison. So I don't know what that's, that's what you said, Fred. <laughs> it's for anybody. One, well, Councillor Gerard speaking, Councillor Walker. Okay, so it got passed, and that's it. People were opposed to it. I was opposed to it, because there's other areas where it could have been, where it, in better areas where it could have been, with a bit, bit more support network. Uh, this motion, to get him back to it, to get back to the nitty-gritty, was only asking for the, the council to bring back a report over the, the state of the, the empty properties that we have. You, you can drive around this borough now and you'll see the same boarded up flats, boarded up houses, 
and other people, I, I see it in all the wards, I drive through the majority of all your wards, and I see it. And it's the same flat boarded up houses, day in, week in, month in, month, month out. This motion was to be, bring back a report from the officers of how to speed up the process of turning these round. And it's, it's quite harrowing to hear about putting the rent up, fair enough. But we're not investing back into these properties. It's not going back in. It's not. It can't be going back into the properties. We've got the same flats over and over again and same properties empty for the best part of six months. If we had people into these flats, they'd be, they'd be getting income back in, surely. We need to turn, turn this round now. That, that's it. It's not going to go through this motion. I mean, it should be ashamed, really, because... No, no, because all we're asking for is, is for a report to come back. You, you've, you've gone round all the houses. You've gone round all the... <coughs> on, one Ger meeting, please. Please let Councillor Gerard you've finish his, his motion some up. Of what you're doing. And I've applauded you in many meetings about what we've done. This is a different issue altogether. This is about getting the flats. What flats? What are causing antisocial behaviour? There's no point shaking your head. It's happening. It is happening. I'm having meetings regular over it. But it's probably happening in other, other areas. We need to turn these flats round and houses round what are called what are empty and have been for a long time. And we need to look at other ways of speeding up the process of doing it. Fair play, it's, it's happening. We're doing it on private properties, and we're doing it on, on, on property. I know there's a big catch-up on the mould and damp issues and stuff like that, but we can't take our eye off the ball and let, leave these properties empty for so long. Thank you. And on that note, I will draw the motion, and hopefully, when we come back next year, right, when we come back next year, that this, this process is speeded up. Thank you, Councillor Gerard. The motion's been withdrawn, so there's no requirement for a vote. That concludes tonight's business. Thank you for attending and have a safe journey home.